Welcome to episode eight of the Bendy and Strong podcast. This podcast is for you if you have Ellis Danlos or hypermobility and you strength train or you want to strength train, or if you are a coach or physio who works with people with EDS or you want to get into working with people with EDS or hypermobility, this is the podcast for you. So on today's show, we have a really, really cool guest on, Mary. And Mary is a bodybuilder. She has Ellis Danlos and multiple sclerosis. And she's currently prepping for the Arnold Classic in the wheelchair division. So I was really excited when Mary agreed to come on. I really enjoyed our conversation. I know you will too. As you can imagine, with an EDS and MS diagnosis, her symptoms are quite severe. And we go into quite a bit of detail on the things that she's done to adapt to being able to train with reduced capacity, both physically and mentally, what she's done to do that. Uh, Also a little bit on her nutrition. She's got some quite severe gastroparesis and digestive symptoms that make it really, really hard to manage her bodybuilding diet. So I found this conversation very inspirational, but not in the sense of, oh, you know, people always say, what's your excuse? If this person can do it, what's your excuse? Not so much like that. I found it very inspirational how much Mary is, how creative she is with how she adapts her training and her nutrition. And I guess the tenacity that she goes after her goal with. The conversation gets a lot deeper towards the end. I don't know if it picked up on the video. I think I actually teared up a little bit, but I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. I really did. And thank you so much, Mary, for coming on and speaking so openly and honestly. And without further ado, One more disclaimer before we go, none of this is medical advice. We are not doctors. This is just two people discussing training with EDS for entertainment purposes only. Now let's get stuck into it. Okay. So we've got Mary here and Mary is in Montreal in Canada and she's got a combined diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos and MS. So we're going to hear a little bit more about Mary's journey, but firstly, I'm going to hand it over to her and she's going to tell us a little bit more about her story with the diagnoses her training and what she's doing at the moment. Well, hi. Well, uh, well, my name is Marie Pontini. Uh, I'm 42 years old. Uh, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2016, uh, relapsing remitting MS. Um, regarding MS, I had it since I was 12 years old, um, but I was never believed. I was obese my whole life. And basically, when I was young, they said it's because I wanted to have attention. And then the rest of my life, they said it's because I was obese. So um, basically, with an MRI, they would have known (laughs) and I would have known back then. But when they diagnosed me, I was very advanced in uh, my uh, in the progression of the illness. Um, So. Yeah, that, that, that was some good part of it, thinking like um, there are some few things that maybe I wouldn't have done if I'd known that it was because of the illness. Uh, but if I'm also honest, I had to do psychiatry since I'm 12 years old uh, and take medication that uh, damaged my heart, damaged my lungs. Um, so... And basically, all of that would have been solved uh, with an MRI. But anyway, so um, I was also diagnosed. So two years later, I was diagnosed with uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, hyperflexible. Mm-hmm. And uh, since 2016, I developed gastroparesis at first. Uh, things got kind of worse, <laughs> uh, especially 2019. And from there, I developed digestive tract system paralysis. So basically, my entire digestive system doesn't work. There's no movement. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm on parent, uh, sorry, and I'm on elemental nutrition, which is like for the feeding tube uh, since 2021. And yeah, so yeah, that's the situation. Yeah, well, I'm just, I, so I, when I first saw you, I think it was on, I can't remember the name of the page, but there's an Instagram page. I'll put it below in the show notes, athletes with disabilities page. And they had shared your post and I saw you on stage at the Arnold Classic. So tell us about that. Did you get into bodybuilding before you had these diagnoses? Did you get into it after? What was the timeline and why bodybuilding? Um, Well, 
I, I, I was training since uh, 2013, uh, but back then I was 310 pounds. I was obese. So um, it, it, it's not really the reason, but basically I, I never went to lose weight or anything like that. I was just going for the uh, brain hormones to feel good after work, but it, it wasn't a passion. It was just like kind of a stress release. And I was not like a big fan. I just liked it, but that's it. Uh, in 2018, uh, because I have very intense neuropathic pain that we tried every, every treatment and there's nothing that works so far. Um, so in 2018, I was to a point that honestly, I was ready to just, uh, pull the plug <laughs> and we have it in Canada. Uh, the possibility to ask for assistance uh, to die. Um, because I felt I was at my, at my lowest and I couldn't continue. It was a full year without with the pain and without any treatment, any possibilities. And I felt like I could just, I just can't continue that way. Um, yeah. But so it, I'm always the person that's going to look for solutions or that's going to look for a good side of things. And, um, it's, uh, after two weeks of having my plan and everything, honestly, the only reason I didn't do it within that two weeks, it's because of my cat, because she was too old and I didn't know what to do with her. So <laughs> basically, and, uh, I realized this is my lowest point. This is my rock bottom. It cannot get worse. So that means. I survived this, that means I can survive anything. And anything that comes to me, I can face it. So I kind of reverse the situation and seeing the power in my situation that this is like, I know that this is the bottom and this is the maximum uh, that it can get. So I can just do better and I can just, you know, uh, be feel better so that's when i realized that i decided to uh start bodybuilding for competitions and seriously because i thought anyway i'm in pain so might as well have a pain that i'm gonna choose uh so it was putting me in a situation that i was empowering myself over the pain over the situation so i was i was always saying that uh that pain is the i chose it so at least it's giving me result and it's giving me a pride, but it's a pain that I choose. So it felt better to be in pain, but knowing why and knowing that it's because I wanted it, you know. Uh, I've always been very careful not to go at war against my body. It was not a war against the illness. It was not a war to get better uh, or anything like that. And over time, like, it, what became interesting is that I had to learn when to push and when to respect the illness, when to respect my body, my limits. So um, that from there, because it could have been very frustrating. I mean, it, it was frustrating and it is still frustrating to see the illness degenerating and to see my capacity to, to train degenerating. But I chose to see it more like a way to force myself to be in harmony with my body. Because it was a game to learn, like, when we give, when we set back. And so I, I really, for me, that it, it kind of built a better relationship between my body, between the illness and my mind. Um, so that's when it started. And I did a few competitions as a guest poser at the beginning because there was no uh, women uh, wheelchair bodybuilding uh cat the division was not in canada well, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so even even worldwide uh, for the women part it's really rare so far um but 2024 apparently is going to be it's the year that things are really starting up uh the division is building the athletes are getting ready they are training uh, the ladies and uh, we're going to really have uh, the division starting to be a real thing. So, yeah. And, uh, well, basically, I gave pretty much everything. Last competition I did was in June at the Toronto Pro Show. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest one in Canada. But I, 
it was really hard because again, my, my, my condition is degenerating a lot in the last year. Um, and for me, it was the last one. It was my last competition. I'm going to give everything for it and that's it. Uh, and I was not satisfied of the result. Uh, you know, like I cannot eat, so it's really hard for me to manipulate the food or to manipulate uh, anything, you know, yeah. like uh, to have the body ready for stage, which athletes usually have that possibility versus the water versus the salt uh, and the proteins and, you know, like all of that to, to bring the mm -hmm. best package possible. And because I didn't really know like how my body react because I cannot really eat, um, I was really, I was really disappointed of what I brought on stage. I did a workout the day before I looked at myself the day after and it was perfect. But the day of the competition, oh, I was completely so deflated. Uh, yeah, I was completely deflated and uh, I, w I was pissed. <laughs> so I yeah, decided, so those, okay, well. Those... Sorry, Mary, so... I was just going to say for those who don't, who don't know bodybuilding, that's something that we do with bodybuilding competitions. You manipulate, obviously you're on a low calorie diet to get lean enough for the stage, but then coming into it, it's very, there's a little bit of science involved in making sure you're the right amount of leanness. Your muscles aren't too flat. You know, you're manipulating salt and water to make sure you're not holding heaps of water so that you look even leaner on stage. So it is something that most, like most bodybuilders struggle with at some point. Like yeah. it's, it's a thing that, Oh, I, 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 every bodybuilder who's done a number of shows will say, oh, this show I didn't come in right and I looked better the next day. Um, but this one, I nailed it. But what Mary's saying is that it was so hard to actually do that because she is using this feeder tube. And there's, does that mean you have a lot less control over what you're eating because of the, like, why does that give you a lot less control over everything? Because the only thing I could eat uh, at that, for that competition was basically uh, the elemental nutrition, which is a kind of a shake. It contains 13 grams of protein right. per day. Uh, basically, your basic body daily just for your heartbeat, for your lungs and everything to function is about 75 grams of proteins that you need for the basic. So I couldn't really build muscle. I couldn't, uh, uh, like you said, you know, like play with the proteins, having more proteins and that stuff. Um, I tried to, because uh, one of the ingredients, the only ingredients basically that with the years I'm still able to eat, it's uh, boiled breast chicken puree. So basically boiled breast chicken that I put in puree with water. That's it. Uh, mm -hmm. So that kind of work, kind of, I'm, it's still making me sick, but that's the only thing that still passed, you know? Uh, so I played with that, yeah. but I made myself very, very, very sick. Um, so this is so all linked to your gastroparesis. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a bit of that, a lag. I was just going to say, this is all linked to gastroparesis, isn't it? So I, I, I am aware that some yeah. people with EDS don't know. I, I have gastroparesis. I have it diagnosed. Um, and But I, I've realized recently that a lot of people with EDS don't know much about it. A lot of them probably have it, but a lot of them don't know much about it. It's Absolutely. basically like slight paralysis of the digestive system, but it sounds like yours is a more extreme version than most. Is that correct? Yeah. Or is it more to, to do with your MS? It, no, it uh, doesn't have to do with MS. It's really linked to Ellers Donlos, but it's because mm -hmm. it's kind of at, at the end. Uh, since 2017, it just kept, <laughs> you know, getting worse. Um, the one thing that people may not know, because sometimes they're going to pass the test, uh, but they just do gastric emptying and that measure mm -hmm. uh, the speed of the food to go through your stomach only. But the problem that most people have with ehlers Danlos is after that. So the transit, uh, like to give you an idea, my, my digestive uh, gastric emptying is normal almost. But my transit, mm -hmm. someone normal is about 24 to 36 hours. Mine is about 150 to 180. This is seven days. So I eat one yeah. thing and it takes me seven days to take it out. So yeah. it's completely different, you know, that, but those tests, they don't do it most of the time, which is the problem. Yeah, that my, my, my gastroenterologist... My gastroenterologist specialized in Ellis Denlos, so I think he must have done that test for me, just for anyone listening who wants to get tested. 
the gastric emptying, I had to eat something radioactive and lie on a table and then they watched me for an hour and mine, mine is slow. So mine takes, I think twice as long as most people's, but then they did another test where I ate something radioactive again. And then one day a week I had to, every day for a week or so, I had to come back and lie on the table. That's the test for the the one that you're talking it about, isn't it, for transit that time? It can be done with a pill, with uh, the pill kind of record everything. Sometimes depending. Yeah, yeah. I think that was it too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, cool. And do you, so do you find that the strength, because obviously with Ella's Dan loss, there's a lot of pain. And with MS, there's a lot of other symptoms that would interact with that a lot. Do you find that strength training helps either the Ellis Danlos symptoms or the MS symptoms or both? Because I know that you mentioned uh, that you're not really able to do as much training now, but how has that helped you yeah. over the years? Well, it gradually this decreased, but I so first I had very from the very beginning I had to wear braces, to wear bandages, uh, and gloves because the the skin of the hand will go away or get damaged. Um, also. So, so what happened is um, I had to have a surgery for both wrists because basically the wrist separated literally from my arm. Uh, mm -hmm. So it worked the first time, but then I kept going with the bodybuilding, even though I had braces. And uh, my surgeon is like, no, because now we would need to reoperate again. Uh, so she's not very happy because she said she cannot do it more than twice. So that's when came the right. point that you have to stop. That's it. And also because I started to develop problems with my elbow because it's now separating from there as well. <laughs> so, um, that's part of the reason I had to stop lifting or doing very heavy weights. Um, also because with MS, my strength diminished. Um, I, I mean, you know, like some days you can do 40 pounds and the next day was five and sometimes zero, you know? So I had to learn to adapt at the beginning, beginning, it was with cables. I would attach, uh, like, uh, some attachment with the cables and I would do the movement with, uh, mm -hmm. the cables. But when I had to stop that as well, um, uh, uh, for the last pull down, I started wearing, it's like loops, uh that I put on the bars to be able to pull. So it pulls from there. Again, I cannot put a lot of weight because after that, it's my elbow that gets damaged. Uh, so I had to adapt with that. So gradually things got worse. Um, right now and since a year now, yeah, since a year and a half, uh, what I had to develop, even back then, uh, because with the list downloads, I don't, feel my body really well to see when is the limit to stop. So I always trained with a mirror. Like from the very beginning, I go with the mirrors all the time to focus on what I'm doing, which muscle I'm talking to, to make sure I do the right movement. I always recorded my trainings as well. I know it's not uh, sometimes in the gyms, you know, like people are going to judge you with that, but I, I did it for myself because that way I knew when I do this, it's doing that. Oh, that's not the right movement to be, you know, like to keep because we can not get injuries really easily. And I didn't want to make things worse just because I want to train. Um, so and from there, when I had to stop uh, lifting, I developed basically the mind body connection. Uh, so by looking at the mirror, uh, it's it takes a lot of focus, a lot. <laughs> and it's basically talking to your muscle, let's say to contract them to the maximum uh, and then do the movement, whatever movement I want to do for the exercise. Uh, and it's with no weights at all. So doing the real exercise, the real movement and contracting the right muscle, but only with my brain uh, and the mirrors. Mm -hmm. So it's exhausting because it's, like I said, it's a lot of focus. Uh, but that's how I train since uh, a little bit more than a year. Uh, it's still working. It's just not the same. Uh, you're not going to build the muscles as quickly as if you would really pull something or lift something, but it's still working. Um, and yeah, I was, I was so, talking to a friend last night and I was saying how I was going to be talking to you today. And I said, oh, you know, this is what 
because I was really surprised when I when I met, first messaged Mary that your reply was I'm currently not training and I was like wow that's that's not what I was expecting um but th then you said that you're doing these mind muscle contractions and I was talking to my friend and he goes to the gym and he said oh does that work can you do that and I was like dude if you don't have to do this you just go train you're you've got the body that can go train go train it can get you results but it, the results won't be anywhere near as much as if you're training normally but if you're backed into a corner and this is the only thing that you can do then it's something that you can do but i just find it interesting to hear i think you and i are kind of similar i'm like i'll get knocked down and then i'll get back up and then i'll get knocked down and then i'll be crawling and i'm just crawling across the finish line that's my approach to training. And I actually think, you know, I get so many people with EDS messaging me saying, how do you do it? How do you do it? And I'm like, half the time it's this kind of thing. I'm crawling across the finish line, but it can get you a surprisingly far because a lot of people aren't willing to crawl when, it, when, when things get to that point. But do you think there's anything in you that like, like what is it about your mindset that helps you to continue to adapt all the time? Is it having that goal? Is it something that's built into you? Is it how you were raised? I didn't want to stop or get pissed at the illness. I didn't want, you know, like to go that way either because I could see the deception and I could see the frustration that it was creating. So mm -hmm. from the beginning, I was always trying to adapt, find ways to do the exercise, find yep. ways to, because with the mess, it's also degenerating quickly. So from there, there was some uh, things that I could not do and others that I had to adapt. Time pressure. So I had to develop trainings yeah. in the bed. I had to tra develop my trainings in a, on a chair and then in a wheelchair. Uh, Sometimes I can stand, but most of the time I cannot. So I had to adapt all the time for all my exercise, for everything. So I just kept adapting. Now I see that I'm at kind of at the end because uh, if I could do a complete workout for an hour with mind-body connection, now half an hour is my big maximum because I don't have energy. Mm. But the energy part is also linked to the fact that I don't eat. Uh, so it's uh, really mm -hmm. hard. Uh, because right now my digestive system is worse than it was. Uh, so I'm on um, water fasting, uh, medical water fasting. So basically since uh, beginning of uh, November. So it's been almost 75 days that uh, does, I'm only on what water. What does water fasting involve? So you're just drinking water. Does it have the nutrients in it? Like how are you getting calories and everything with the water fasting? Just water. Yeah. So it's not something healthy. It's not something you suggest. It's not something you do if you don't have like a complete follow, like with the medical uh, part, you know, like, but it, that's, that's only water. I take a few vitamins and supplements, but uh, minerals, let's say, uh, but I cannot really take any nutrients at all. So mm, that would be exhausting. After 30 days, we tried to reintroduce the food because that was the hope that maybe we could reintroduce something because I don't tolerate the elemental nutrition. And we wanted to postpone the parenteral nutrition, which is by vein, because from there, your life expectancy is not necessarily very long and I wouldn't uh, get mm -hmm. much uh, proteins. So basically, uh, that was the hope. It didn't work after 30 days. So we're trying another 30 days. It didn't work. <laughs> that was a few days ago. Um, so right now, I'm going to stay on water until this, the, the competition. Right after the competition, I have a surgery as soon as I come back. So mm -hmm. we want to wait after the surgery to try whatever else. But it looks like it's going to be the parenteral nutrition right now. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, that's okay. why I don't have a lot of energy right now. So, you know, yeah. it, it affects my training. But yeah. Yeah. I, I want to ask you something about something that you said before, because I find this very interesting. You said you're not, you've always tried to not be at war with the illness which I think is a huge thing for everyone with chronic illness. You know, I've been, there are times when I've been at war with it. Like I watched my dad, he had, he had cancer for 18 years. It was basically a chronic illness. I watched him, you know, being at war with it, not being at war with it, accepting it. Do you think you always had this mindset of I'm not at war with it? I, I feel like for a lot of people, there's this, this process of at war, then something happens and then you just have to accept it and be and come to peace with it. Was that yours or have you always not been at war with it? Like, how did you get to that point? 
Um, it started when I was waiting for my diagnosis at the hospital. I was reading all the books about it because we kind of knew that that's what that that it was MS. Uh, but I still I were still waiting on some results, and everything I was reading about it was about accepting the diagnosis. So mm -hmm. I by myself, I don't have family, I don't have a boyfriend or whatever. So I told myself, okay, I'm gonna give myself one month to go through this, figure it out, like what's gonna be the future at worst, you know, worst case scenario, and and then that's it. And it worked, <laughs> kind of. Uh, you know, like I, I went through the whole process of accepting the diagnosis and anything that came after that was part of the deal. Uh, of course, there's a few things that I didn't figure that would happen or that, you know, that I would be subject to that. Um, the first thing, it was the brain because most of my lesions for MMS are in the frontal lobe. So uh, my... I'm part of a very small 10% of people who have MS that have that many lesions and that they are also in the cognitive part. So I have a lot of cognitive impairment and that I didn't count on. I didn't think I would, it would happen. But I, I remember the beginning, you know, like I would go to work, I had, I was walking and then I cannot come back from work. So I need to buy another cane. You have no clue how many cane I bought to be able to go back home because I didn't bring it to go to work, but then I couldn't make it back home. So uh, that was this, there was so many things that one after one things were getting bad. And this is, we're talking about like four months after the diagnosis that things started to go bad. The reason it's like my neurologist said it because it was at the end of the illness. It was also, it is also uh, an aggressive form of MS, which is not usual. Um, so I realized I cannot be pissed all the time, every time something new happened because it keeps coming. It just doesn't stop. Every week you get a new symptom. Okay. Now you don't feel your feet. Oh, now you don't feel your hand. Now, uh, you know, like every week something new was coming. So I realized, no, no, I, I cannot be pissed all the time about something coming. I accepted the diagnosis. This is part of the diagnosis. Well, deal with it now. So. I developed the attitude from there that whatever comes, it's part of it. It's part of the deal. You know the deal. So there's no point to complain about it. There's no point to, oh my God, this is happening or to worry about it because I see a lot of people worrying every time they uh, they have a new symptoms or something. You know, is it a relapse? Yeah. Is it something? No, I, I don't want to do that game. So that's when it started. Yeah. But as I trained, the things started to get worse as well. and. Again, I didn't want to stop, like, to, to start that game. I didn't want to, because I can see, like, so many of my friends, so many people, when things start to get worse, or, you know, that they, they, they get pissed or they, they against themselves or against their body. Or, and I'm not going to treat my illnesses as an entity itself. It's not me and my MS or, you know, no. It's part of my deal. This is who I am. And that's it, you know? So it's up to me to develop yeah. a harmony and to be, if I want to be happy, I need to see that it comes all together. It's my brain, it's my body, it's all together. Um, so yeah, that, that was, a, that's that been a very important point and it still is. I'm not saying, you know, like we see the reality, we live the reality. I'm not saying that it's just frustrating, but that's what it is. So I just don't focus on it. I'm not going to, oh my God, no, 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 it's getting worse today. It happens. Okay. Okay. I see that. that that's the end for today. Okay. Yeah. That's it. You yeah. know, now what? And yeah. when something this... was stopping me like a new exercise or something I couldn't do. Okay. Now what? Okay. Now we have this sentence. Okay. Now what? What, what, what do I do with this? You know, finding a solution instead of why me or whatever like this. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple of things that sort of sort of stood out to me with, with what you were saying there. One of them was like that idea of I'm giving myself this amount of time to kind of grieve and stress and worry about this. And then that's that time. Yeah. Like I, I found yeah. myself doing that as well. When I'm injured, when I've got a flare up, I'll just say to myself, okay, you've got this afternoon. You've got this afternoon. Go cuddle your dog and cry in bed. And then after this, we're getting up and we're finding we're finding a way to, to work around it. Um, the other thing that, that really stood out to me, there's this concept of, I don't know if you may not, may not be familiar with 
the terminology, but you're definitely ex executing it is emotional flexibility, which is like the ability to kind of not be rigid in, I have to be happy. I have to be this. I have to be this. A situation comes your way and you can adapt to the situation accordingly. And I, I really like that term emotional flexibility. And that's what I've often reminded myself and I'm not necessarily the best at it, but something comes your way and you just say, okay, I'm going to just accept this and deal with it. And then something else comes your way and it's like, okay, I'm going to accept it and deal with it. It's kind of like in, you know, you're playing dodgeball and all the balls are coming at you at once and you're just kind of like, okay, it's all right. I'll just, I'll just take it. The next thing, yep, I'll just take it, um, which can be tough, but that's, I think almost like, I don't know. I hate to be the person who's like, oh, there's a silver lining in every bad situation. But that is something that I think that we're really good at with chronic illness. I think we can get really good at that in a way that other people can't. And it's a nicer way to live life, right? Like with that, okay, I'll just take it as it comes. Yep. I'll just have it happen to me. Everyone has something really bad happen to them in their lives and we're just better conditioned for it. We're ready for it. <laughs> we're, we're ready for Sorry. it to happen. Yeah. 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 Um, so with that in mind, I guess we've, we've touched a little bit on how you've adapted your training with the illness evolution. Is there anything else you'd sort of say with how you've adapted your training? Um, well, you, you asked me at the beginning about, uh, how the sport or how the weight training helped me with the illness. Um, mm -hmm. and that part is also part of how I adapted it because, for example, with Ellis Donlow's, most of us, we have neck pain. And part of the reason it's because our muscles are not strong enough to hold our neck, our head. And basically, you know, so it goes on the, uh, the, the joints. Uh, so the, one of the things I did, I overdeveloped my traps. It's not the way that people develop their traps, especially a woman. Um, but because of that, I don't have pain anymore, you know? And as soon as I stop training my, my traps, I can see the pain coming back. So I go, I have to go back, you know, because I had a, a few surgeries. That, so every time I have the surgeries, I have to stop the training. And after like uh, two, three mm -hmm. weeks, I can see the pain coming back. So it helps me for that. Um, Again, I'd never train with the, the optics or, oh, it's going to help MS, it's going to help the illness or whatever. No, I train for the hormones. I train for the pleasure. Uh, when I get at the gym, it's my playground. I'm there to have fun. And that's it. That's what I focus on. And if the rest comes, well, that's good, you know, because it's the only outcome that I can that I can. Uh, control basically you know like uh one of the things that i had to adapt uh it's to learn that okay well this is my best for today i'm giving my best i cannot say how much i lift for any exercise because one day it can be 90 pounds the next day it can be 40 and the next day it can be nothing so from there i cannot increase my weight or i cannot Keep a, no, I have to see at the moment that I'm going to do the exercise, what is it going to be? So the thing I focus on when I train is to give it my best. Whatever that best may be, whatever it means, like how many pounds or whatever, I don't care. Even if it's five minutes of training because I'm too exhausted, I don't care. I gave it my best for today. That's it. That's what I can control. So that's the part of the things I adapt with. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it's interesting because people often think of like this, you know, self-compassion, this, this, okay, I've, I'm giving it my best today and that's all I can give. Um, being gentle on yourself, being kind to yourself. People often think of that as a weakness or a, you know, if you practice this, then you're going to go down this path of, of not achieving anything, but actually it's what the best high achievers, high achievers do. And that's a really interesting um, thing because like a lot of people who are really disabled by the Ellis Danlos would probably look at you without knowing your story. Um, and especially if you were just sitting in a chair, not in a wheelchair, they would look at you and they would think, oh, well, this person has, based on her physique, based on what she's doing, she must not be very disabled. And But, but actually 
and they might look up to you and think, wow, she's doing so much, especially when they hear your story. And then to hear that it's actually self-compassion that's getting you there, that's allowing you to do this stuff. Because if you were hard on yourself and you just went into a session and you said, oh, I can't do it, therefore I'm throwing in the towel, I'm not going to do it, that's actually, that gets you nowhere. So with with that though, I think this is like from a logistic standpoint, a challenging thing to find your limits each day, right? Like that's something with people with chronic illness really struggle with, especially chronic illness and trying to push your body. It's a very difficult balance. How have you gone with that? Like finding your limits um, have you made mistakes? Like it's, it's one of those things you don't know your limit until you find it. How do you, how do you manage that? I made terrible mistakes, uh, you know, but let's say you decide, okay, I'm going to push today. I can do this. Oh, you know, and then you're in your bed for three days. You cannot move at all. Uh, the pain is crazy. Well, gradually by making your mistakes, you learn you know, you learn when is the limit or when to go and when to push and stuff. Uh, it's true that when we do it, even though it's my best, even though I have reached a limit, I know I gave it all. I gave with the maximum I could give. But also in a perspective that I need to have more. Well, first, when I train, that's all I do for the whole day. I don't have enough energy to do anything else. I come back home and my day is over. So it's a big sacrifice uh, that I take because like right now I'm training for the all know there's nothing in my life. I mean, I, I can barely do my laundry. I can barely do the basic stuff because all I do is training. And after that, I'm completely out for the rest of the day. So mm -hmm. it, it it is part of the sacrifice, but there's also like, how am I going to train to reach my maximum but at the same time, not to be kill myself uh, in a way that I'm not going to be able to train tomorrow. So, you know, so, OK, it may knock me out for the rest of the day. For me, that's part of it. And I'm OK with it, but not to mm -hmm. knock myself out for two days either. You know, uh, so there's that part. I've learned to use concentric movement instead of both, uh, you know, concentric and eccentric movement. Uh, with the concentric one, yeah. again, you don't build as quickly as usually, but uh, it allows you not to be sore the next day. So that's another way that I save my body a little bit uh, for the pain. Um, but it, it was a lot of mistakes, a lot of error. Like, you know, like I developed a discipline that I'm not going to negotiate with myself, basically. So... Back before COVID, every morning, I wake up at 4 a.m., I'm in the gym at 6 a.m., and I do my workout no matter what. I may not be able today, I get in the gym, and I'm not able to do anything, let's say. It's okay, but I made it to the gym, though, and I'm going to make it, you know, like, for the days that I'm supposed to show up. And this way, that's my way to stay accountable to myself, but it's, it's, it's just a decision that I wouldn't allow myself to, to negotiate. You wake up, you go to work. Do you negotiate with yourself all the time? If you start doing that, you're not going to go to work a lot, you know? <laughs> so the same thing. I would just go. Um, it became a little bit harder at home to train during COVID and all this, but I developed the same, the same discipline that I just do it and that's it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it takes the discipline. It takes the limit to see. Um, but it's really by trial and errors, you know, like uh, you do your mistakes, you you pay the price basically, but I allow myself sometimes to do like an extra, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that I like to try. So back then, uh, when I was doing better, I was doing this like almost every week, uh, an exercise that I'm not usually able to, or that I know that is gonna make damages <laughs> and knock me out for two days, you know? So the day, the workout, the last workout before having a day off, uh, I would do another exercise that, you know, like I'll, I, I want to try or just to have fun, you know? So yeah, with that, for me, I really like it. It's like, a, it, it's really like going to play, you know, like the other day I tried to jump. I didn't jump in, I don't know how many years, you know? <laughs> uh, so it was cool. It was a bit of energy that, okay, it knocks me out for real. But I remember sometimes even trying to do the the stairs, the stairs master. Uh, 
I was able to, but I would pay the price also after, you know, so, uh, but it's to play with it. It's to have fun, you know, like a game, but also respecting yourself so that you can function and to, you can have a life and continue to do it. Uh, but yeah, it, it takes accepting that, you know, it's, a, there's a limit, but I'm still going to go back to the gym by respecting those limits. Yeah, it's funny what you're saying yeah. about having fun there. Like I get sometimes people asking me, you know, because I'm I'm a big advocate of strength training is a great way to manage Ellis Dan loss. Like you've you've yep. explained yep. yourself with your with your symptoms. And, you know, I'm talking about, you know, play it safe, do these, this is the way to do it. This is the sort of better way to do it. And then some I, that, that's sort of what I'm known for talking about. And then someone will come along and say, oh, like where does bodybuilding competitions fit in with this? And I'm like, oh, I just love to compete. I just really love it. And I, I enjoy it. And the more I do it, the more excited I get for it. Um, wait, it's frozen. Up. Oh, there we go. Um, the more excited I get for training and same with powerlifting competitions. No, it's not going to help your condition to enter a competition. In fact, it might actually hurt it a little bit. But if I don't have that kind of passion and that kind of excitement for it, I'm not going to enjoy it as much. And life is meant to be enjoyed. And also it does a lot help with my motivation to do this kind of stuff. And I'm sure for you, you wouldn't be pushing hard in the gym if as hard in the gym, if you didn't have the competition coming up um, or even doing all of the mind muscle connection stuff that you're doing now, it gives you something to focus on. Certain personalities need that certain personalities don't, but I think you and I are probably the kind of personalities who do really need that. And it's just like, sometimes it's not about optimal or the best, you know, you do have to, as you said, know your limits. And I would never do an exercise that I know is going to do permanent damage or put me out for a couple of weeks or months. But sometimes it's fun to push a little bit harder and then just accept the consequences for the next couple of days, not pain, just fatigue. And um, okay, maybe I pushed hard in the gym, but I'm going to have to take a couple of days rest now. Again, not pushing through pain, but yeah, just having some fun with it. Yeah. Uh, right now, this competition is a little bit different than all the others that I did because uh, the reason that I cannot train a lot because I don't eat, uh, I see, I can, I can look at pictures from October and I can see my muscle mass has diminished. Uh, so it's really hard on the pride or the self-esteem to see just a degeneration and no improvement. Um, so that's why I don't push too much right now so that I don't eat my muscles, basically, um, because I don't get any nutrients. I don't have a lot of energy. Um, I cannot do cardio. And so this competition, I know I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win in that minding. To, that's not why I'm doing it. You know, I'm doing it because I want to do it, because I want to be proud of myself. Also, because I know that what I have today is more than what I'm going to have tomorrow. And I don't want to regret of never doing it. So for me, it's like probably going to be my final. I'm still looking to probably do the Olympia in uh, October. Yeah. Uh, the Olympia is the biggest competition worldwide. Uh, things going to have to get better for me to do it. I'm going to have to be able to eat again for me to do it. Because if I keep... Uh, pulling the string that there's nothing more to give, you know? Uh, but yeah, it is a bit frustrating right now because I had to come back to my first thinking or my first minding that you're doing it for the fun or you're doing it, uh, for that reason. And no, things not going to get better. You cannot push for the last month. Right now we are one month before the competition. Usually that's where you push. I cannot push. I cannot get better. I cannot mm -hmm. do anything to be in a better shape or anything, you know, I yeah. just have to kind of let go and that's it. Um, that's, it, it is frustrating. I mean, mine was, yeah. I was just going to say mine was nowhere near as severe as yours, but I definitely had that with my bodybuilding. Like my coach is like, let's push hard. Now I'm like, I can't walk today. I'm in so much pain. I can't physically walk. My pain threshold's really high. You know, I can't just push through this. And it was a lot of just letting go. And like, you know, my digestive system really didn't handle food coming into competition. So on comp day and basically the couple of days before, I basically didn't eat. So it, it was just like, you know, we, we just couldn't do these things. And you just have to over prepare ahead of time. But you, that, that's not always an option. And 
did you like this is something I struggle with a lot is this you know you mentioned before the pride and the ego I guess that side of things knowing that you're capable of things but then your body currently isn't and knowing that you've done more before and that's something that I struggle with I know a lot of other people with EDS struggle with it too they'll be like oh I'm doing this silly little exercise I should be doing more and I'm like how do you think I feel like I represented my country in my sport and I'm doing the same silly little exercise how do you do you have any strategies that you use to get around that or is that something you struggle with as well it's a mental game. Uh, I had a few days that I uh, lost motivation. Um, but I, th- th- like I said, I kind of, because I'm not going to stay. I, if I see three days in a row that I'm not going well, the feeling well mentally, and I'm starting to look at other people and I know they're going to win or, you know, like other co- contestants. If my, yeah, my motivation went really down and I started to have it down. So mm. I went back to why are you doing this? Why are you there? You knew from the beginning that it's not going to get better. You knew from the beginning you couldn't eat. You knew you were going with that minding and with that in mind in situation as well. Nothing has changed. It's just frustrating more that now we're getting closer uh, to see the result is not what it was, let's say, two months ago. Yeah, but you knew that. So stop complaining, mm-hmm. do it why you want to do it, because I want to be proud of myself. I deserve to be proud of myself. I deserve to do it and look back and be like, yeah, I did that shit. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, like, um, I also know that if I would have done it in 2019, I would have get a completely different package or even 2020, whatever year mm-hmm. before I would have been even more proud, but I didn't. But I don't want to look for next year and then thinking, oh, I should have done it in 2024 because now it's even worse. And also, I see that also it's probably the end for me to train uh, with the food. I don't think I'm going to be able to do competition much again, but Mm -hmm. I want to do it before before the end, you know? So I want to be proud. I want to say like, okay, this is my goal and I'm achieving my, my dream. But it's, uh, sorry, I completely forgot the question. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. It's just interesting because I think a lot of people's coping mechanism for something like this would be denial. But I, I don't think denial and burying your head in the sand about the illness is actually the way to move forward. Like this is something that my last podcast guest and I were talking about, you know, she went through this phase where she just kind of, um, no, I don't have Ellis Danlos. No, everything's fine. No, I'm not falling apart. No, everything's okay. But that doesn't help you. You have to actually acknowledge the condition. But that doesn't mean acknowledging the condition doesn't mean you don't have ambitions. It doesn't mean that you can't work around the condition. And it it actually gives you more tools to know. And and sometimes people will say to me, oh, you talk about your condition so much. And like, it's, it's, you know, I think almost inferring like, why don't you just ignore it? And it's like, because I'm not going to be my best version of myself if I just ignore this. I actually need to acknowledge what's going on. You know, if you're sailing on the sea and there's a storm coming, you don't ignore the storm. You batter down and you get ready for the storm. So um, that's, it's almost like this enormous amount of acceptance for what you're going through. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Because if you ignore it, it's not better mentally. Uh, But when I acknowledge the situation i acknowledge it without emotions because i don't want it to become Mm. a situation i don't want it to become the whole focus the focus is yeah i do have enough i know that now what do i do with this i see the situation i see the reality of what is now but i don't put emotions in it and i just focus on what i can do from there or what needs to be done or you know uh, because it, it's easy to make uh, the illness like the, the center of your life and that basically stops you from existing at the same time, you know? So for me, I'm not my illness, but it's part of me as well. I mean, that that's what it is. But mm-hmm. I'm not going to deny it at the same time. If I talk about it, there's no emotion. If I think about it, or it's in terms of rational and for a solution, not for... Like as if it's a big bubble that is uh, strangling you or that you're living it, you know, inside. No, it's just there. Yeah. Okay. 
but that's not my life, you know. So yeah. I don't have to say uh, I do to find say that. Yeah. I do find it's funny when you're talking to other people though who aren't going through that. They it always that attitude always makes them quite uncomfortable, doesn't it? Like I remember you know, I've mentioned my dad had cancer. People, oh, the cancer word is scary. And I just threw it around. Like I've, I've known that he had cancer since I was in primary school, since grade five. Like it's just part of our family now. It's us, dad, mom, dad, and the cancer. Like it's just how it is. And people get so uncomfortable and, and they'll say, oh, but I'm sure he's going to get better. And it's like, no, he's not going to get better. Like it, he's had it for 18 years. I don't think it's going anywhere. Where is the cancer all over his body? Oh my goodness. It's like, it's fine. I'm not, I'm at peace with this. And it's the same with, with this kind of chronic, do you get that as well? When, when people sort of say, Oh, but I'm sure you're going to get better. I'm sure this is going to, it's like, no, I'm not, yeah. but it's okay. Like I've accepted it. I had a few phases, you know, like different phases. Like at the beginning, let's say I would need help. I would start to, well, I need help because I'm unable to, uh, to control my hand or I'm unable to this. And then I start explaining the illness or the, the why this situation is, uh, there was a period I would explain to everybody like the whole illness, which didn't work either because it's like people, they don't want to know. They're afraid. They're afraid to hear like it's something that they could get out of the blue as anyone mm -hmm. else. Uh, they're afraid mm -hmm. of the handicap. So honestly, I feel like even in accepting the diagnosis from the beginning, I feel I was extremely lucky because I have nobody around me. By being alone, it's me with myself. You don't have the pressure of a family telling you like you need to get better. If so today, today is a good day. You don't want to say it because then they're going to have the expectation. Oh, she's better. And if today is a bad day, you don't want to say it because then they're thinking, Oh no, it's deteriorating or something. You know, it's getting worse. So you end up with that pressure as well of their expectation and their vision of the illness. Uh, so just that for me, I feel that I'm really lucky. Uh, the friends that I have uh, happen to have MS as well, that I met them through the MS networks, but they have the same thinking, the same minding as me. We're never going to talk about the illness unless it's to talk about finding a solution or something, you know, like, oh, it seems I have this new uh, symptoms. Oh, really? And it stops me to do that. Did you? Do you know any tricks for that? That's it. But it's not like it's not, our lives don't turn around the illness, you know. I forget again what I was talking about. <laughs> That's sorry. okay. No, we were just talking about how uncomfortable how uncomfortable the non sick oh, yeah. people get when so, you when so you talk when about. So people yeah. bring me that. I had a phase that I would answer them like, "No, it's not going to get better. No, it's degenerative. No, you know, like because it would get on my nerves when I would hear that." Um, now, honestly, I just let them go and let them be. I don't want to get involved in that. It's like, yeah, you talk and I don't care. It's like, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, same way, like, oh, I'm going to bless you or something and I'm going to pray for you. OK, whatever. You know, I just I don't get in that game of explaining or talking. But it's true that I have some days that I would like them, like, let's say I meet friends from a long time. I would like them to understand, no, it's not going to get better. No, it's, you know, like it is degenerated. It is degenerating right now. So it's my body attacking myself every day, nonstop. It's not even like cancer. Cancer, you might get better. You might be a survivor. I'm never going to be a survivor. Every day that I do, I'm, I'm a survivor, but it's never going to go away. It's never going to uh, get cured. So, and I'm not living in that expectation as well. You know, I have so many friends, they're yeah. waiting to have a, um, a cure to start living. No, you're alive now. So live now. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's deteriorating. Okay, but what can you still do? What is still possible? Because you're alive. Uh, when, when my cognitive impairment started to get worse in 2017, it went to a point that I have executive dysfunction. So that means I'm not able to figure the task to do. Sorry, yeah. I'm not able to figure the steps to do a task, a basic task. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't wash myself. I couldn't cook. I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, when I get a brain fog, it's still the case, but things got better with energy management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thanks to COVID, I've learned a lot about my energy management. But it, it was to a point that I was completely uh, dependent on people of, of home care services uh, because they had to tell me, let's say, uh, take the soap and open the water and 
and put the soap on your arm and then wash yourself, you know? So all those steps, someone had to tell me or to do it because I couldn't figure it out. Um, it, it, it went to a point because I was def defining myself before I, before I mess, I would say everything that I am is because of my brain. I would owe everything to my brain. And when the cognitive impairment started, it's like, oh, <laughs> there's no brain, dude. You cannot even think or you can, don't even know how to wash yourself or forget about it. So you have to redefine yourself from what is here now. And it got to the point that I had to wonder, what is it that the illness kind of take away from me? Because it was taking everything one after one. Uh, and every time I would hang on something, it would go away in, in, in a way or another. So I realized that was my happiness. And I started focusing on that because when my uh, impairment get to get worse, when I'm tired, stressed, in pain, uh, or like right now, you know, like I'm starting to get tired, eventually I cannot even talk. So um, not only I don't understand the conversation, but I cannot talk. And this is the last... <laughs> The last symptoms that is very extremely hard to accept when it happens. Um, but then I just ask my best friend, you know, like, make me laugh and make sure that I'm happy. And that's all I need, you know, because that I had nothing basically left. I'm alive, though. So what can I still do? I can focus on being happy. That's it. Um, I'm glad that I've learned and things change improved with the energy management, with the bodybuilding and everything. Uh, but I know that at any time I could get a relapse and get at the same point that where I was. My uh, lesions didn't disappear. And even if I just get too tired or I exhaust myself, it gets to that point. So I know it's not something just because I don't have it right now. It didn't go away. It could always be here tomorrow. Uh, same as many symptoms that got better the lesions are still there. So at any time I can get back to that. So I make sure that I appreciate every single day that I have, every day, everything that I have. Uh, I'm able to think today. Oh, I, I remember like, I'm, I've not been, I've been able to do it once, but I was able to read a book about uh, two months ago. I, I couldn't believe it because I hadn't been able to read since many years. Um, but I was really happy and it was like, okay, I had that today, you know, uh, it may not be yesterday and it's not probably gonna, gonna be tomorrow, but I had that, you know, so every day that I, I focus on what do I have, what, what is there and I'm alive for me, life is the most precious thing. And as, as long as I'm going to breathe or that I'm going to be here. Okay. Well, let's enjoy life let's appreciate what we have in our hands because it's precious you know and yeah so that's that's my way that i um i focus always more on what i have than what i don't have uh i'm never gonna focus on a symptom that because you know with especially with a mess you kind of lose like let's say you you don't feel this body part and then you you cannot uh, grab things and then you, you 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 know like symptoms accumulate one after one it's yeah but that's not going to be my focus the focus will be on what i still have you know um yeah so yeah that's so something like i've mentioned before with you know my dad having cancer for a really long time and with my eds it's i think when you've got something like that so with his cancer he never went into remission he was battling it for 18 years it was you know, this neuroendocrine cancer. So it acted almost like an autoimmune thing. He had to have major surgeries every couple of years, chemotherapy. It was just like this ongoing thing. He was very similar to you though. He went out and cashed in his, we, in Australia, we call it a superannuation. It's like your retirement fund. He cashed in his retirement fund to start up this huge medical practice. And he would, you know, a couple of years before he died, he went sailing all around the world. Um, that was his personality. And it's interesting because a lot of these things that you're talking about here is stuff that people only realize on their deathbed. And, you know, you I might be reading about something on social media and they'll be saying, here's the dying thoughts of um, 10 different people and what they wish that they'd done differently with their lives. 
But having something like this, it actually brings it to the surface a lot earlier so that you actually end up living your life according to this dying person's thoughts. And when I'm reading these a lot of the time, you know, cause, because dad just died like about a year ago. So this is, this has been very fresh in my head. And what I realized when he died was that humans often don't realize what we have until it's gone. But also we have this tendency where we have to have the full lesson to learn from the lesson. So we don't learn from just the thought of, oh, I might die one day. We have to watch someone Mm -hmm. die to learn that lesson. And we have to go through this, you know, in your experience, this MS diagnosis to realize. And there were so many times along that path that we thought dad was going to die to the point where, you know, about eight months before he actually died, we, we all thought this was it. And that taught me, okay, I need to, I ended up moving interstate to live closer to him. And I ended up, okay, I'm not going to push hard at work today. I'm going to take the afternoon off and go and spend time with my family because this is important to me. And I don't know how much longer I've got. And it's this weird, you know, dichotomy where when you've got this awful thing in your life, it is awful, but it actually shows you what really matters. And it shows you these things that people often only learn when it's too late. And that's kind of something that I said to a lot of my friends. I was like, please learn from this experience that I've had. Don't wait until it's too late. And I, like it's not a thing that to say, oh, it's all worth it to have this condition and it it shows you this new way of life and this is a positive thing to find in it. But it, it is interesting. Something that I've noticed is that people struggle to learn these kinds of things until it's very late. But when you've got this kind of difficult situation in your life, it lets you learn that lesson before it's too late sometimes and you have it's very drawn out so I think normally people just have this lesson at the last you know week or couple of weeks of their life but for us it's drawn out over this longer period it's just very interesting I find it very interesting absolutely and well I just just to finish on what you were saying uh you know like I remember like we had the MS convention and there was a man who got diagnosed and had to stop working he was in his beginning of the 50s you know and it, it he was really disappointed to realize that he had to stop working and i it i think it's important that when something happened you to remember that an event is just an event uh it's all about how we're going to react how we're going to choose to react what kind of feelings we're going to decide to involve in this and what kind of perspective we're going to choose that's going to make the whole difference. But the event itself, it's just an event. Uh, you know, like, so the person was complaining that uh, he was nothing basically now that he couldn't work. Mm-hmm. And I explained to him, you know, like, right now you're just in advance. You have the most beautiful chance to stop working while you're alive, while you're kind of healthy. Uh, before the illness that they degenerate too much. Uh, because anyway, in 10 years or 15 years, you're going to retire anyway. But you don't know if you're going to mm-hmm. make there. You, you're going to go. You don't know if you're going to be alive in, te- in 15 years. If not, you're not going to have a heart attack or anything else. So see it as an opportunity to be like, well, I'm still kind of young. I'm still kind of healthy. Uh, but now I can. It, it's the first opportunity to redefine yourself. A lot of people, when they start to, when they get retired, uh, they don't know what to do. Or it, either way, when you, your role in life change, it's just about redefining yourself. Um, and whatever you can now do, it's not about looking at, oh, I cannot be myself or I cannot do this anymore. You know, the gentleman was a mechanic in, uh, in a plant and he, He's saying, like, I cannot be a mechanic anymore, but this is who I am. But I kind of remind him, the choices that you made when you were younger for who you became, those choices were made with uh, circumstances as well. Uh, Maybe you were not uh, the best, the top one at school, so you had to go in mechanic. Maybe you had the push of your parents to do the same job that they do. Maybe your father had a garage or something. Maybe they wanted you to be a doctor or something. So maybe you didn't even decide who you're going to become. And you became that with those circumstances that shaped it. 
Now you just have different circumstances and you can just reshape yourself to whatever is here now. And that's, that's something that you're going to have to do when you're going to retire anyway. So it's an opportunity. Uh, the same way that when sometimes I see men who have dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, and they feel that they don't have masculinity anymore, for example. First thing, most ladies, if you're heterosexual, most ladies, they just, they don't care what works. They just care that they're going to be pleased. So if you reassure them that, you know, I'm able to please them, my partner, and that's it, that, that's all they want to hear. Um, every gentleman or most of gentlemen, eventually when they get older, they're going to lose their, those functions. And it puts you in a situation that you're just in advance from them. <laughs> you know, maybe you're 40 years old or you're 30 years old and now you, you have sexual dysfunction. Well, it gives you an opportunity to learn and how to please your partner, to learn and how to please or develop different ways to be uh, happy sexually. That you're going to have to face anyway when you're going to be seven years old. So you're just going to be better than all the others, <laughs> you know? Um, but it doesn't mean it's the end of something unless you choose to define it as being the end of something instead of just being something different. Uh, different is yeah. not necessarily bad. It's just different. Yeah. yeah. And, and something I something I remind myself of as well is like, you know, because I, I was very competitive in powerlifting, powerlifting when I did it, but I can't compete anymore because of my Ella's den loss. It, it, you know, I've got, I get a lot of problems with intracranial hypertension, so the cerebrospinal fluid problems, and that that just stops me. And sometimes I think, oh, I'm losing myself. And then I, I just remind myself, it's like, no, the same attitude and person and brain and, you know, determination that made you good at that can can do other things this is this attach yourself to this identity not to that external identity attach yourself to this this is who I am I'm someone who's determined I'm someone who will find ways around things I'm someone who will who loves a challenge who loves the excitement of a challenge all these things that made me good at that can also make me good at this just the circumstances have changed a little bit yeah. um which is tough to so do but to it, you kind of have to do it. Without, uh performance parameters you know uh you don't need to achieve something to be someone you don't need uh, an achievement to define who you are it's gonna be a little bit harder to find it but everybody is more than whatever we achieve so we have to learn to redefine ourselves without any achievement without any talent without any of this just you who are you as you like you mentioned you you can be determined and it's going to last. Um, the experience that you develop, let's say, for that type of job or that type of stuff, you still have that experience. Um, and you may, there's the two, the two ways that you can redefine yourself. You can redefine yourself in new things that you are not able to do, but also in ways that it's not about doing whatever. It's about who you are, period. So. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So I'm just aware of the time, Mary, and also yeah. I know your energy is fading a little bit. But we've got coming up, you've got the Arnold Classic, and then you've also yeah. got, hopefully, the Olympia as well. Is there anything that anyone listening can do to support you on the journey to get there? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, we have a GoFundMe. Uh, that has been organized so that we can raise the found, uh, the funds to go to the competition itself, to the Arnold. Um, my Instagram, uh, on my Instagram, you can find uh, adaptive workouts for absolutely every type of setup that you can imagine. So outside, inside, at the gym, on the floor, on the bed, in the chair, whatever. So uh, there's a lot of... Uh, that of workouts that you can subscribe but also a lot of just my life philosophy or my journey and how i see life so my instagram is just marie pontini marie pontini i'll link it below um, i'll link it below sorry i'll link it below in the show notes so people oh, can okay, find okay. it easily and there's the gofundme that is also on my instagram um but yeah that's uh 
that's a big hope. Yeah, so that we can raise uh, some money to uh, to cover those expenses. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you want to add before we sign off? Um, there, just there, <laughs> there to ask for help, there to try something new, there to be someone else. Um, yeah. I mean, That's what awesome. we know about ourselves or about life have been defined in some ways, but an illness is often an opportunity to see things differently and daring to go outside your comfort zone and just see whatever is there. Uh, it's worth it because the closer, the more you get closer to your inner self, I think, the more you can become happy. And that's mm -hmm. what for me is important. And so I really hope for everyone uh, that through the journey of the illness, that as it gets better, as it gets worse, whatever, um, through your journey in life as well. I mean, it's not only about the chronic illness, uh, that you can find uh, your your way and through yourself by daring, by experimenting and trying life uh, as your life. All right. I want to say thank you again to Mary for joining us for this podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation. And if you want to follow along with Mary, I'm going to link her Instagram below, but it is uh, Mary Pontini on Instagram. And I'm going to put the link below as well for anyone who wants to support Mary through the GoFundMe that's been set up. For those who don't know, bodybuilding is a very expensive sport and it is expensive if you're able-bodied and you work a full-time job, it's still an expense that needs to be factored in. And for Mary, she's gone from working as an engineer, running her own business to relying completely on disability income. Uh, I'm not sure how it works in Canada, but I know that in Australia, disability income often is not enough to even get the basics, uh, let alone do something like competing internationally in a competition. So in order for Mary to represent the Ella's Danlos community up on stage at the Arnold Classic, she will need some help. So if any of you have the means to give, I know any donation, big or small, will be really appreciated. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be posting more EDS videos, interviews, podcasts, training videos, everything. If you really enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you could comment below and let me know which sections really stood out to you. Um, or if you're listening on your podcast app, make sure you subscribe and feel free to send me a message on Instagram. I'll link it below, but my Instagram is Annie Short Strength. And that's all for now. Stay tuned for the next episode. And until then, happy training and catch you soon.